Hey, hey, welcome to Talking Smack Intellectually. I'm your host, the upsetter, always upsetting the status quo. I'm feeling really good today as we are still in the crux of celebrating dynamic women in recognition of Women's History Month. Today, we have a special guest, the remarkable Senator Val Applewhite. Senator Val Applewhite is not only a trailblazer, but also a pioneer as the first Black woman in her prestigious position. Her presence, her activism, her advocacy are highly valued, and I'm thrilled to have had the opportunity to engage in meaningful conversation with her. So get ready for a dynamic and engaging episode as we explore a range of important topics with Senator Applewhite. We speak not only about politics, but a range of different things from Black hair to technology to Generation Z, to even the manosphere. So sit back, relax, and let's go ahead and dive in. As a state senator, what inspired you to pursue a career in politics and public service? Well, I'm retired from the Air Force. I don't, at least I never thought that I would be an elected official, but I spent 20 years on active duty in the Air Force, and it's a a service environment. And so transition into public office was a continuation of that. Hearing Fayetteville, I really saw a need that needed to be addressed for our community. So, you know, it's like politics found me. Folks in the community were like, wow, why don't you run for city council? I was like, that's crazy. But I thought Mm -hmm. about it and I said, why not? I would give it a chance. So my first elected office was on the Fayetteville City Council for three terms. And Mm -hmm. so as a senator, this is my first term as a North Carolina state senator. Nice. And you said that you were in the Air Force? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I served 20 years on active duty. I came in at 18 years old. You know, I was trying to figure out a way to pay for college. That was 1979. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of dating myself a little bit, but (laughs) I came on active duty and the Air Force, and I traveled 20 years. I got a chance to see the world. And, you know, part of that traveling from Asia to Europe and throughout the, you know, stateside, you got to see how people live in a different dynamics, things that were better and things that needed to be changed. So, yeah, I traveled the world. I was in communications. I uh, served on Air Force One, right? That was an exciting yeah. assignment. But I also served time in Korea, you know, in the field, digging ditches, walking through rice paddies. So that was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) For real. Well, thank you for your service. We definitely appreciate that. And Senator Applewhite, considering the significant societal changes from your childhood to present, what are some accomplishments related to women in society that you are most proud of? Well, you know, I don't think, think that things have progressed as fast as they could have or or mm-hmm. or should have, right? Mm-hmm. We're still experiencing a lot of firsts. For example, I'm the first Black woman to ever serve as state senator for, for my district. So mm-hmm. while we have made some progress, particularly through our voting power, because I don't, you know, there's a saying that power concedes nothing without a demand, Right. So while we've made, yeah, we've made progress in in various fields, but, you know, I personally don't believe that it has been fast enough or or broad enough, not just in politics, but in education and the the health, you know, field. When you think about, you know, you know, Hillary Clinton running for presidency, right? That's crazy, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at that high level, we still could not get that done. And I think right. that's a reflection of the patriarchy that still exists in our country. You mentioned the patriarchy that that we see in the country. And surely, like, the podcast world right now is really heavy in this man versus female <laughs> energy. What What is your take on it, or have you been able to experience that? Oh, every day. I mean, mm-hmm. every day, even as a senator. There, you know, there's like microaggressions, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in the Senate, you know, senators have the courtesy of addressing people by their title and their their last name, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and all of a sudden I show up, it's like, hey, Val, right? I'm mm-hmm. like, no. 
Right. That's not what we're going to do here. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't mention is prior to running for Senate, I left city council and decided I would run for mayor. And what was interesting, I was the only woman and there were five white males in the Mm -hmm. primary. I killed it in the primary, Mm -hmm. 53% of the vote. Nice. But before me, yeah, it was one. I was right. I was killing it. I didn't have any money. I had people. I was knocking on doors. Look, if you saw me in the grocery store, I was going to talk to you. If you were pumping <laughs> gas, you was going to get a car. <laughs> so, you know, I I won the primary with fifty three percent of the vote. The four males got together and endorsed the second person the second place person and I lost that race oh, wow. by 260 votes. Right. So I was the only woman in the race and, you know, the aftermath, I spoke with people being a veteran, mm-hmm. you know, some folks had said, you know, Val, we don't know, you know, how, how do you win? Some men literally said, yeah, just because she led in the military doesn't mean that she can lead politically. Does that make, see mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It, th- right. There wasn't a transition of leadership ability because I really don't think men are are ready to give that space over. So it's not going to be a matter of giving it. We're going to have to take it. I experience it every every day in a room that is predominantly white and male. Mm. There, there is a talent. So you have to walk boldly into the room and, and mm-hmm. you have to be. I often feel that I have to be extra prepared, right? You know how that goes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's an everyday occurrence for women in general, but specifically women of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and then how do you escape the, sometimes it feels inevitable title of angry Black woman? How do you do it so gracefully? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I had a radio announcer refer to me as an angry black woman on the air. Oh my. Oh yeah. <laughs> on her on her Christian radio station, a black, you know, Christian radio station. And I wasn't listening at the time, but someone called me and said, Hey, did you hear what they had referred to you as? You know, so I, I called the owner of the station and I said, Hey, you're gonna have to take accountability for that. And the response was, well, you know, we we didn't mean it in a bad way. We meant it in kind of like a, a Tyler Perry kind of way, right? This is insult to injury, wow. right? But how do I deal with that? I remain authentically who I am, mm-hmm. right? Authentically who I am because the leadership and the boldness that I display, you know, if a male were to display it, it's leadership. When we do it, it's the angry black woman thing. I'm conscious of it, but I don't allow that to to speak truth to power. And that's right. what it is. When I go in the room, I try to be the smartest person in the room. I'm engaged. I'm leaning in. And they're not always ready for that. So that's the pushback. Oh, she's angry. No, I'm not angry. I'm just holding you accountable. And I think right. for, for some, right? That's their way out because they're not ready to deal with us in certain spaces. Many Black people express skepticism towards politics. They often feel that, you know, their voices and votes go unheard. How can we effectively encourage greater participation of our people in politics and to rebuild trust in the political system? You know, that's a million dollar question. What I don't believe is effective, particularly with our younger generation, is the the narrative of how our ancestors fought and died for this. I don't know that that really resonates with young people anymore, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So so we have to find a way to show how politics affect them personally, how it affects Mm -hmm. their personal lives. I was in a meeting, a training session, and some young black men there, and we were talking about the power that different elected 
offices have. So we started speaking about the DA. Mm -hmm. Once they understood that the DA is the one that can give, you know, sentences, unfair sentences to Mm -hmm. people of color time and time again, many of them young, young black men didn't know that was an elected position. And I had one young man. Yeah. Right. So it comes down to education. So, so I had to let him know, no, the DA that is, you know, this, in my opinion, disproportionately, you know, sending people of color to prison to bringing charges against you, your vote can change that. That's Mm -hmm. one example of how we have to educate our community about what this means to their personal lives, whether right. you're in school, right? You're in college trying to figure it out, trying to, you know, pay for college, whether you're a parent and how these offices affect the funding of your schools that your children go to, how it affects mm-hmm. the the quality of life in your community. So what I do, I'm really an organized returned elected official, right? So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I, I work with, you know, various national nonprofit organizations that deal with voting rights and, and issues that affect marginalized communities. So mm-hmm. we have to educate our community about issues and how they respond to that because no one is coming to save us but us. And if we can demonstrate that if we build our collective power, right? Mm -hmm. Building our collective power, we can move forward. But key word is collective. Right. How do how do our communities come together collectively? I was speaking at a luncheon for uh, last year, Delta Sigma Theta. I had a room full of three hundred black women. And I said, do you understand your political power? If you understand it, we have to be able to identify the priorities that we have. So if I were to ask a room full of women, what are your top five priorities? We would be all over the place, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So not just as Black women, but as people of color. And I'm going to emphasize on that, right? Put emphasis on Mm -hmm. that what is important to us, and how we use our vote to hold people accountable. I'm an elected official. When I come to your community, you should be, you should be saying, hey, Senator, you're, you're cool and everything, but how are you going to affect education, right? And if we choose right. to support you and you don't carry through on those promises, don't come back here next time, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you know, I may be all over the place, but I want us to recognize the power that we have, bring it mm-hmm. together collectively to promote an agenda, Love criminal it. justice, it's- housing, water, mm-hmm. voting rights, whatever those agen- that agenda is, and hold people accountable. But we haven't done that yet. And that's the work that I continue to try to do. And community. And we definitely appreciate that, encouraging civic engagement. And that's that's vital for our community. And so how do you, what are some of the ways that you connect to the Generation Z? You mentioned this generation. How do you connect to those constituents and, and ensure that generational Z's voices and concerns are heard in the legislative process? Right. So I believe that you you have to meet people where they are, right? So I find spaces in community. It might not be large audiences, but, you know, like spoken word events, right? And if there are different events around the community, I go or I know people individually that I ask questions to. I think that as an elected official, we have to learn how to listen first, Mm -hmm. right? We have to start. Stop letting elected officials come into our spaces and say, this is what I'm going to do for you. It's not how it's supposed to work. So what I do is I engage young people and say, hey, tell me what's going on. 
Like, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, mm-hmm. what's important to you? And and I often tell them that my, my children are 25 and 30. And I sit down and I try to understand the challenges that they are facing. For example, housing, right? You know, I, mm-hmm. I own my own home. My oldest son says, Mom, we're priced out of the market now. We, we, mm. we can't live like you all live. You know, the house that is now $300,000, you bought for $100,000. So right. that's not something that I live and I understand that. So when you ask the question, how, you know, do I connect? I listen. I was like, I go to the university. I say, hey, come have coffee with me. I meet mm-hmm. people at different events. Here's my card. Help me to build your agenda. And what young people have not experienced is people in power asking them what their issues are and how we can go about addressing or solving those issues in the legislative process. So even mm-hmm. though they don't understand the process, I'll say something like, so like you're in college and you you can't afford to eat when the cap is closed? Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm like, mm-hmm. okay. So I go back to the HBCU caucus or, you know, different caucus and say, how do we find funding for that? So that might mm-hmm. be the, the long response, but wh- whether it's young people or seniors, I meet people where they are and understand their needs, if I'm truly going to represent them, no matter the age or the race or the demographic, I've got to have conversations with you. And I think listening is a big part of of the steps that you said to connecting with Generation Z. I think that they they definitely appreciate that because a lot of times they feel unheard. And so definitely salute you for that. You've sponsored a range of impactful bills from the voter fraud prevention to firefighter health benefits. Can you share how your personal values and experiences shape legislation you support? Well, it goes back to engaging. And a lot of the legislation that I introduced is the result of a conversation. So, for example, I had an attorney came to me and said, Val, trying to get people to do jury duty is Mm. hard. Mm -hmm. We don't see people of color, we're always, <laughs> look, I'm, I'm real talk, I try to get out of jury two at time or two. We all have. <laughs> One of the things that he said is that many people can't afford to take a day off work, right? In point. Mm-hmm. And in North Carolina, I think it's like $20 a day or something. So what what I did, I said, you know, and, and it's important to have juries that reflect community, right? Mm-hmm. I introduced legislation that said, okay, however many hours that you're performing jury duty, you get paid at least minimum wage, right? Mm-hmm. You get okay. paid money for transportation to and from your house. You mm-hmm. get paid money for, for, for lunch and to eat. and mm-hmm. And that is just an example of a piece. It didn't, you know, the way our legislature is set up, the chances of it passing was planned, but I introduced it anyway, and I will reintroduce it, reintroduce it. But it's not so much my values, it's prioritizing the needs of the community and introducing legislation that I think can get some traction or be reintroduced. That was mm-hmm. just one example of of hearing the community. Right, right. And reflecting on significant, well, the significance of the passing, I think it was in 2022 of the Crown Act by the House, which prohibits hair mm-hmm. discrimination. Mm-hmm. How, how do you describe the evolution of your own feelings and experiences, particularly when it comes to wearing natural hair from younger years to present? Natural hair. And, you know, that means a lot to us people. Now, early in Mm -hmm. my 
in my political career, you know, I had the shortcut. I had it relaxed. And, you know, I just decided I just wanted to be natural. I had had it. This is who I am. And it was funny that, you know, I have a team of people that are around me that deal with image, right? And Mm -hmm. I didn't tell anybody I was cutting my hair off. (laughs) (laughs) I literally went in my bathroom and said, where's my kids' clippers? (laughs) (laughs) And and, and I did have a... Listen, listen, they saw a picture of me. I posted it. And one of the guys called me immediately. He was like, what is the world? And I was like, yeah, how you like it? He's like, you can't do that. That's your image. Oh, my God. I say, hold on. Hold on. You all get paid a lot of money. Do you deal with it? Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> Love that. Because this is, this is what it is. Right, and and right. you know what was beautiful? I I, ne- I I won't forget this moment. A little while after I cut my hair, I was in a grocery store, and a little girl. She's about seven. Mm-hmm. She's about seven. Cute little girl. She kept watching me. She kept looking at me, and I said, "Hey, sweetie," and she said, "You're so pretty. I love your hair." Mm-hmm. Well, that. Just like it wasn't it powerful. Mm-hmm. I I like wanted to cry. It was very emotional to see a little girl, right? That would see my natural hair and to stop me in a grocery store and say, "You're so pretty, and I love your hair." Right, right. So I don't know that it was maybe it was an evolution that I wasn't conscious of, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. there had to be something internally that made me walk into the bathroom with clippers and say, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it, it was an evolution. I guess you can say that's right. So I, I mm-hmm. stand where I am. I mean, there are days when I might put on a little wig because I want to, you know, switch it up a little bit, but mm-hmm. I embrace, I embrace who I am and. Right. I'm never going back and our society now has become more accepting of it. And I think that's a message. You know, I, I hope younger women will engage because you see a whole lot of things out there, but accepting who we are as black women, naturally, naturally who we are. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's the first step. I agree. And that, as you shared that story, I get goosebumps. I, that was just, I was trying to visualize. I'm a visual person and I was visualizing mm-hmm. that exchange, and it it was very powerful to, to hear you express that, and for me to create that vision in my head because we do need to see more images like that. So thankful for you know legislation like the Crown Act to take place. It's sad that it had to happen in in 2022. You know when we look when we reflect back in the progress you had talked about earlier, not moving fast enough, but eventually coming to you know coming to fruition. So. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, yeah and, isn't there? A, uh, I wanted to bring up. Isn't there? A, I think it's in Texas. Isn't there a young man yes. there that continues to get suspended from school because of his walk? The fact that we still have to endure some of the discrimination that our ancestors, as you mentioned earlier, fought for, and it, it, especially in big states like Texas, I, I think it's interesting that I think it's interesting that we have individuals that are willing to fight against him. You know, That's right. Student fighting against it, and 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 you kind of think like on a human level, like we know this isn't right. We don't need like legislation to tell us it's not right because we know it's not right. I I, I just find it sad, and I, but I do like victories like this because we can use these as talking points to connect to the younger generation in hopes that it pushes them into politics and places where yeah. it create change. Yeah, yeah. So it's it might a be a movement. A, yeah. I'm sorry. Creating movement around that. No, I was going to say, you know, so these incidents can be like, you know, bittersweet sweet in a way that unfortunately we have to go through it, but sweet in the way that, as you just mentioned, it builds movement. And, and you know, one of the things that I do, I'm 63 and, you know, I've got a few more years in this game, but, you know, after a while, I, I think, 
you know, we have to bring younger people into this space, right? Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. spend a lot of time mentoring young people. I want them to yes. understand what this is like. And when I have interns that come in the Senate, every single one of them, I have them sit in my big, cushy leather chair. Mm-hmm. I, I, I get out of my seat and tell them to sit down. And I say, this is your seat. Mm. This is this is your seat. And I take a picture of them. The seat meaning the power. I am one of 50 people in the state of North Carolina. One of 50. I want them to know that they too should be in this seat of power. And when they're on the legislative floor, I take a picture of them and say, this is how we change things on this Senate floor. And I give them a picture. I take a picture with them and I tell them, don't forget it because you're the next generation. Right? Right. Right. Yeah. So I I want younger people to really understand the power that they have. I don't ever, I don't ever assume when I engage young people, I don't tell them how to do it the way I did it. Because it's a different right. game, right? The game right, changes. Right. But I want you to step into the space and know that if you get ready to do right. something real crazy that you can't recover from, I'm going to step in and say, hold on. Wait a minute. Right. Because right. this system will kill you if you are not careful. Right. Do it and, your and I, and way. I hope, Go ahead. Right. I, I was wanted, wanted to make sure that his name was shared in the public, but he's 18 years old, Daryl George, that's the, the young gentleman in Texas. The, the judge says that the teenager suspension over the dreadlock doesn't violate the Crown Act. So I do hope that moments like this, as I mentioned earlier, and you, you were saying as far as creating movement, doesn't discourage this young man, but actually encourages him to mobilize and, as we say, create movements around this, because Texas did pass Texas was in favor of the Crown Act, which, mm-hmm. was, you know, mm-hmm. forbids racial hair discrimination. But as I stated, it, it, it is really just heartening to see that this was even a thing, you know. But again, I just hope that that young gentleman, Mr. George, that he actually might take some, take this as a motivating factor to get into politics, to, to change legislation or to mobilize this community. And I think moments like this could, again, be kind of bittersweet in a way that he had to go through this, but we, and, and the, the way that he gained the support and hopefully built movement around it. And, and you know, so I want to make sure I heard you right. The judge said that it was not in violation of the Crown Act. Yes. Says it doesn't violate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So here's an example. That judge is on a ballot. Mm-hmm. That judge is elected. So when I say that, we have to understand how these positions impact our lives. People should mobilize and vote this do it out. Right. Like, really <laughs> take a stand. He has to be a no, I'm listen, I'll fly to Texas, don't play. Right? Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. even if you can't get him out, have mobilize and hold him accountable. Right. Because what that may happen. What that may lead to is that other judges that are sitting around watching that and how people respond to that, they won't mm-hmm. do it again. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm actually going to see what I can do, you know, to reach out. Because like I said, when moments like this happen, I don't do not want people to get discouraged. I think no. this is an opportunity, you know, and, and lots of times people will use these moments when I speak to not even just the youth, it's, it's people my age um, and my generation, the millennial generation, older millennial generation that will mm-hmm. use opportunities like this to be discouraged and to push against, you know, getting involved in politics or saying things like our voice doesn't matter. And it, it's very cringy, although I understand where it comes from, but I feel like, you know, it stagnates us. And so I know I'm going to try to see what I can do to reach out and also bring awareness to this because that was awesome what you just said as far as holding that judge accountable. And I think it's just the lack of the lack of education and awareness in our community as it relates to politics. So that was a great point. It really is. Mm -hmm. 
my 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 graduate program, you know, is in political science, and one of the papers that I did it it it, it showed that you know compared to white communities, civics and political science is not taught in school anymore. It's, it's just not mm. unless you're in AP classes, and other you know other communities have this conversation at the dinner table. We don't. We used to go to churches to get our political mm-hmm. information historically, right? Mm-hmm. That's how we were educated. But now our churches are 501c3s, right? <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and they don't really want to get in. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. So now mm-hmm. our churches are afraid or just don't educate our communities the way they have in the past. So I want to go back to an example that I, 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 I told you a story earlier. When I lost my race, I came to the mm-hmm. primary, 53% of the votes, and I lost the general election by 260 votes. It was not the loss that hurt. It was mm-hmm. for weeks afterwards, I'd be in the community, and they'd be like, hey, at the time as a councilwoman, Councilwoman, why aren't you the mayor? We're confused. I said, well, I lost. They said, no, you won. And Mm. what it took me time to realize, my community didn't know. They stopped at the primary. Oh, wow. They they stopped at the 53% win. Mm. They did Mm -hmm. not know. So after I heard it a couple of times, I said, did you come back out and vote a second time? And they were like, well, why would I do that? Wow. So I, I was at a buffet and a lady had come over to me. She said, come over here and ask my mom and tell my mom and my auntie. So I went over there and they're like, baby, what happened? We thought you won. I said, y'all didn't come back out a second time. And they did not know the difference between the primary and the general. And I mm-hmm. knew at that moment, had I educated our community, they would have come back. Right. But they didn't right. know. Right. Right. And that's huge, and right? That's, so yeah, that's it huge. wasn't the that, that, mm-hmm. Gosh, it wasn't the law. I was hurt that my people just didn't know. And I, I so, think that the lack of education yeah. just or awareness of like how this how the political system works really it's de- it can be detrimental to, to our community so these things like using this as a learning experience even when i speak to our generation the generation before and also the generation after about how politics works a lot of them don't know they don't know the the importance of vo- voting locally taking place in your local elections outside of just you know presidential right they're not sure how that works they don't know how a president wins in popular vote but electoral college how they end up actually losing. So I think this is moments that we should reflect in our get out to vote campaigns is not just get out and vote, but understand voting, understanding the elect, you know, the political system Absolutely. and the election process. Yeah. Absolutely. I want people to share... don't know that judges get voted in, you know. They, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Judges and DAs. We, mm-hmm. we called our training what's on the ballot, and we weren't talking about the name, but the power of the position. What mm-hmm. the DA, how the DA, how judges affect your lives. Those are not the sexy, you know, air quote, sexy positions that people right. talk about all the time. Mm-hmm. But these are the words that literally, if you're a black or a brown person and you are standing in a courtroom, you better hope that that judge or even the DA understands your experience, your lived life experiences, because mm-hmm. if not, that can be problematic. And, and I wanted to share a bill. I don't know the bill number, but it's called the riot bill in North Carolina. Right. It's called the riot okay. bill. And what that did was after George Floyd, the protests that we had in North Carolina, they moved a piece of legislation that really impacts communities of color. 
So mm-hmm. I, I was at Fayetteville State uh, speaking at Botrella, and I asked the students, had about 200 students in there, had they heard of the riot bill, and none of them had. So what this bill now in general, what it can do is let's just say there's a protest. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes there are bad actors in protests that infiltrate peaceful, mm-hmm. you know, protests or whatever. You know, John, you know, Rakim, whoever is standing there and a window is broken. He didn't throw the rock, but he's arrested. Mm. He's arrested. Now, the mm-hmm. first thing that happens is that you can't get immediate bail. You have to stay in jail either 24 or 48 hours to let the streets cool off. So you can't get out of jail immediately, right? Right. And then now ch- children under 18 can be charged with felonies. So mm. let's just say some little 12-year-old was out there with what parents thought there was going to be a peaceful, a peaceful protest. It was just a thing that we need to bring our children out to these community events. That mm-hmm. child, that minor child can now be charged. Wow. And people wow. can be personally liable for damage to the the window that was broken. If now it's not just the insurance agency that might um, pay for the business's window, you know, the person will be held responsible for it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so when the next situation comes up, because there will be another time when, you know, young folks, even old folks like me, will get out and protest. If that thing turns bad, there's mm. a whole host of things that will keep young people. You have a felony. Of course, you can't do what? Can't vote. You can't get money for college. Right. You can't. Mm-hmm. All of those things. What can we do? <laughs> it, it would be long term. I think the first thing is we have to be aware of it. And that's what I intend to do with other grassroots organizations like, you know, that operate in, in our communities is, first of all, I want y'all to know what's at risk here, okay? Mm-hmm. Before you come out, mm-hmm. you need to understand this. It is law now. The only way that it could ever change is that, you know, the General Assembly flips over. There is a Republican majority in the House mm-hmm. and in the Senate. If at some point that ever changed, that would certainly be a law that I would look to rescind. But right mm-hmm. now, we don't have the power to to change that. It, it has not been challenged in court yet. We have not had any, any protests. But I'm sure that, it, and it was done in response to George Floyd. I mean, mm. the legislators said that. They, right. they said that. People turned up in Charlotte. They turned up in Fayetteville. They turned up all over. Legislators said, we're not going to have that foolishness around here. We're going to make a law. So if you do turn up, this is going to be harsh consequences for you. So mm. I, I, I share that to say their votes do matter. How do you anticipate the uh, 2024 elections playing out particularly considering the potential candidates of former President Trump and President Biden. And and what impact do you foresee this having on the political landscape? It it has everything to do with it. I mean, we don't have enough time. I'll I'll just say literally our lives depend on this. And we may say this every election, but (laughs) I don't even know where to begin. I, I am concerned. You know, one of the things that young people are feeling not heard at a time mm-hmm. that is so critical when we need them the most. Mm-hmm. We need, in North Carolina, we need turnout amongst communities of color that is parallel to 2008 when Barack Obama mm-hmm. mm-hmm. we, we need that level of enthusiasm and I've been in this game a long time and I don't feel that coming. I I just don't feel it coming. Mm -hmm. So I am concerned. I I don't believe in speaking anything other than, you know, goodwill into existence. But if we take this for granted and we get caught up in the, the little things, (laughs) 
you know, who we like, who we don't like, you know, politics is not a popularity contest. It's a policy contest. It's about policy. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So focus on policy. Who's, who will impact our, our, our right to vote? Who will impact our ability to provide for ourselves economically? Who will help us more likely be able to afford education? You know, the courts have done away with affirmative action. They're doing away with DEI. All of these things that we have fought for in the past and have lost, you know, traction on. We're losing mm -hmm. rights that we fought to win. So I am hopeful, but I am concerned. I hope that our young people will turn out. We know that the highest voting demographic are people 55 to 60 and above. That's the highest mm -hmm. voting demographic. The demographic that is missing at the polls, this is data. I'm a data person, 18 to 35. 18 mm -hmm. to 35 years old, mm -hmm. they're the lowest voting demographic. Wow. Um, yeah, 18 to 35. And, you know, Black men have got to go to the polls. I'm right. going to give you some real talk right here. Black women, we show up, we're the highest voting demographic percentage-wise. Black women mm -hmm. show up incredibly. We've got to make a space for Black men to vote in the same numbers. I don't have the answer to that. I, I've asked Black men in our community, 100 Black men. We have all of our Greek organizations to really get on the ground and engage Black men the way I engage young women, right? It's a different mm -hmm. voice. It's a different conversation. But I hope that, you know, there is effort to reach that demographic, 18 to 35. Mm -hmm. And if they don't show up... You know, if you look back historically, who elected Barack Obama's college students? <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. they, they, they were insane. They were crazy. <laughs> right? I was like, right. oh, my God, where are these kids? I say kids, but where are these young folks coming from? And what happened immediately? Automatically, in North Carolina, nonprofit groups, was hard to get on. You couldn't get to, you couldn't get on HBCUs. You couldn't talk politics because the other side saw colleges and universities, not just HBCUs as, you know, democratic strongholds, right? So there's so much power in that. I hope that we can find the enthusiasm. There's an enthusiasm mm -hmm. that I don't know the cause of it. You, would you agree? I, with I, that? Remember, I was mm -hmm. in New York and I believe I was traveling back to DC. That's that's where my hometown is. And I mm -hmm. just remember like the Washington Post to get a paper. <laughs> it was the lines were out. I mean, every retailer that was selling the Washington Post, the lines were out. My father felt inspired, even during the race, obviously, he went out to vote. He just felt inspired. And I was like, wow, because that's you know, my dad was kind of this militant guy. And mm -hmm. and so it was amazing to see the energy was, was definitely there. And I oftentimes wonder what happened because Black men did lead, lead the charge historically when it came to voting yeah. and being in, you know, in politics. And and we support it. And so there was a shift somewhere, you know, as I'm doing history on women's rights and particularly women's rights to vote. I was actually on a panel in a panel discussion with this guy, he's like, you know, women didn't vote because they didn't serve in the military. I'm like, that's not the reason why. That wasn't the, <laughs> the reason why we <laughs> our right to vote was taken away. And so as I'm doing right. the timeline to study women in society, it's, there was definitely a shift. And I, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out what happened as it relates to Black men when it comes to voting and the political system ancestors fought so hard and we as I talk to different people it's it's like a discrediting of the work and and I'm yeah. talking about men that are in that age gra age bracket a little bit older probably yeah. like you know 35 to 45 or so that mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. seems so discouraged and 
and I don't know what happened. And and some some of them are are well, you know, doing well off as far as they have a job, stable job, married, kids, and they just feel so far removed from the from the process. And I don't know what I can do other than continuously work. I even challenged one guy like, hey, in August I'll come to your t- your city. And I'm and I'm not in politics, but I want to prove to you how these things work. I want to show you and your community how you can get involved, how you can mobilize, how just being aware, just giving it a chance. Because just because one incident happens doesn't erase all effort. And I say that with passion. And I I, I try to figure out again, like what happened. <laughs> um, no, you, you you're right. The support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I know you're you're you know this discussion is about you know women. When you look at civil rights movements and, and most movement, movements in this country have been led by women. Mm-hmm. Been, they've been led by, by women from, you know, Montgomery uh, bus boycott. Women have always played an integral role in that. And it's an interesting dynamic is that women have continued to, to, to move forward and mm-hmm. without our men. And, and and I mm-hmm. think that's important. I don't have the answer to that. But, right. you know, one of the things that was disappointing is when Kamala Harris mm. became the, the VP. Mm-hmm. I had never seen such disparaging remarks. You know, right. some people say she's not black, but it, she's a woman of color. Mm-hmm. The most disparaging remarks were coming from black men. Tell me and that. When I, when I mentioned earlier about this idea of the, you know, the, the manosphere, what I said, you know, the whole gender war, to hear some of the comments that Black men do say about Black women and the issues that they take upon, like, for instance, the brick lady, you know, although she lied about being attacked by a brick, I hated to see that Black men drove the or led the, the mission <laughs> to prove this woman wrong and to... Mm-hmm. And to disparage her name. When mm-hmm. we come across issues across Black men, we don't go into their history. We don't go into the George history. We stand strong and we know that what happened, we look at what's in front of us and what happened, we see injustice and we support it. And I find it just so discouraging. Even the woman in Chicago who was viciously attacked by a man in a store as she was getting her food. And I was in all these different panel discussions and things like that on Clubhouse. And just hearing some of the men just say, oh, well, she should have just kept quiet and making a case for this woman being beat, you know, in the face by a man who obviously had his own, to me, I think, mental health issues and unfortunately lost his life because her son came through and, and protected his mother. And I just remember right. the conversation before they even knew, like, it took the law to tell them that it was wrong instead of their sight. I remember rewinding the videos, looking back and forth, trying to discuss, like, I could have been that woman. I could have been trying to explain, like, hey, uh, you know, I, you never know. And to and to not have empathy for women. Right. Issues. I talk a lot about, you know, sexual assault and rape and to and yeah. try to reel into these guys' heads, like, clothing is not consent. Stop, you know, at, like, stop empathizing with these these monsters. They, they, they're not regular guys. They're not human. They're, you know, I was going to say they're not human, but they're not, they're not to be, to me, empathized with because they're violating the woman's body. They're violating, they're taking people's innocence. They're, you know, and I just try to drive that in like, they're not you. And, and just because you guys share the same gender does not mean that you have to have some type of empathy for those who attack. And oftentimes the, the victim gets chastised and we don't focus on the perpetrators. I, I try to speak and do as much I, as I can just kind of in my generation, because I see that a lot of it isn't just young, the younger generation. It, it sometimes happened in that 35 to 45 age group. And oftentimes I see it happening mostly in that because obviously that you know, as peer to peer. So, you know, I try to advocate and do what I can. And, and there is a, there's definitely a lot of pushback, a lot of ignorance, a lot of verbal violence. And it's hard. It's hard. It's a lot of in, online bullying. It's hard to be in those spaces with certain types of men who may be used to the barbershop talk and they're not used to women 
um, entering in those spaces. Ex- and uh, exactly. Yes. You, you, and know, you, you know, you <laughs> know, that that's powerful because, you know, when we go back to the political space, it's the same thing. You know, where I would think that like black men would be like, this is not a black man bashing moment, right? It's not. Oh, that. absolutely not. But I'm just, <laughs> yeah, it, it's not that. But when we look at our our community, if we have this dichotomy within our own community, how do we get better as a people, right? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. And, and there are times in my political space where I'm going to tell you, some of the men are just like, Black men are extra. <laughs> They're extra, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I I try to stay in my 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 political voice, but sometimes I just have to go there with you know with some of them. I'm originally mm-hmm. from New York. I've lived in DC. You know, I'm not nice. scared. <laughs> but if you want to have that conversation with me in that way, I can get with you. And and, and you're not going to like how this is going to end because I'm going to put some truth out there with you. Our right. community cannot get better. What you describe about this woman being attacked, what happened to our men being our protector? What happened to our men saying, hey, Pamela, you're not going to say that about this sister. You're not going to call her all of these words instead of leading it. And that that's That's hard to take. It really is hard to take. And I Mm think your passion for Mm -hmm. what (laughs) you do, right? But Mm -hmm. we have got to come together. And I don't have the answer. Mm -hmm. We have got to somehow figure this out because collectively, you remember when I said earlier, what is our collective agenda? Right. What is our collective agenda? We cannot have an agenda that makes us whole if we're not communicating with each other. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you, it's an interesting dynamic when you, you think about what's happening, what might happen in the presidential race. You're, you're, I'm a Democrat. Republican Party, mm-hmm. they're picking off Black men. Black men are trending to the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're trending. You have to think about that dynamic, right? <laughs> and I, I said, well, maybe do our men think, well, because black women are who, 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 we're the Democratic Party, we turn out. <laughs> do black men feel like they need their own space? <laughs> I don't understand that. What right. do you think? Right. I don't know. I... I never thought of it that way. I, I never actually thought of it. I, I I always thought that they were pulling out altogether of the political world and advocating for, I mean, what I hear is they advocate for, you know, black nationalists, similar to, you know, Marcus Garvey and somehow out what the ancestors did. I hear a lot of that. I hear a lot of mm. revolutionary talk, like pulling away from the system itself and, and not like living with the system, living within the system. So I've I've gotten criticized a lot for, you know, advocating on using the system for justice, you know, and I'll say things like, you know, in, you know, 1964 really outlawed discrimination on a systemic level. However, you know, on a personal level, people are still racist. And I try to drill in the idea that we can use the system and use things that have been in place that can help us bring justice like the EEOC. And right. how does that look? You know, when you do face racism, try to say remain calm. I'm, I look at lots of different documentaries, and and I love one of the things that they did teach or train our ancestors did, which was being vigilant but also being calm and objective. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. attacks, and that's powerful mm-hmm. because you can mm-hmm. you, you can, but you can't really arrest a person who's calm, who knows their rights. Who sets, and, mm-hmm. and then also bringing awareness to, you know, using your technology, using your phone. So mm-hmm. those things, like, how do you mirror, how do you mirror, like, technology, the things of today, social media, having a voice, mm-hmm. and the things of the past where they did remain calm, they understood their rights, they knew their rights, they sat in, and they endured, 
but they didn't just endure and sit there and nothing happened. They they endured for the cause, but they also mm. put put to the pavement to make a change. So how do you make a, a how do you marry that? And that's what I, I think about. Like how do you marry both of them? This is exciting because you 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 bring together an excellent example because you know the whole march on Washington, all those collective things in the civil rights era led to what? Legislation. Yes. Legislation, the Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, it led mm-hmm. to legislation. And mm-hmm. and I would agree with you 100%. I, listen, if, if you want to do some nationalistic thing, then that's fine. But it's the system that we have to operate within, really, for real change. Correct. I mean, mm-hmm. let's just keep it real, right? We can, mm-hmm. you know, have this feeling, but in reality, this machine <laughs> in mm-hmm. America, we've got to know how to operate it and, and be a part of it. Working right. outside of the system for small things work, but overall, it's the laws of this land and the right. money, mm-hmm. the money that changes things in this country. I tell people all the time, you know, what do, what do you, I ask them, what do you have in common with, with Bill Gates? And most folks are saying nothing. I was like, y'all both have one vote. Mm. <laughs> y'all both have a vote. <laughs> yep. You, know, you don't have a whole lot more money, but at the end of the day, votes count. Right. But in, in using our votes to further our our collective interests and and you know th- that's what I have always tried to do. I don't know, as I said in the beginning, that I ever said, "Hey, you know, I'm going to run for for office." That was never in my plan. I served 20 years in the Air Force. I was encouraged to run for city council. I became disillusioned in local government because. I had this crazy idea that I would serve in elected office to change people's lives. Mm-hmm. But early on, I found out it was about money, right? And mm. and, and I said, okay, I, I'm done. I'm going to take my ball. I'm going to go home. Prior to running for Senate, I worked with Healthier Together, which was, it's a nonprofit that we did COVID-19 outreach to marginalized communities, black, brown, indigenous, Latino communities. And I went across this state and I saw how people live and I just mm. was shocked. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know people live like this, like mm-hmm. right in our presence. And, mm-hmm. and we, we still did not have the Affordable Care Act. And I decided mm. to run for Senate, literally, because of what I saw to change right. people's lives, black and brown communities, to be a voice for others. And, you know, there's something ironic about my journey, because mm-hmm. yeah, I've certainly talked your head off today. So thank I'm you for allowing me to say this was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> this was what I needed this morning. Right. No. So, I so think let me tell you, my. I, I want to share this little story, and I'm gonna let you go. Oh, I'll for let sure, you go. For but, sure. Yeah. So, the beginning of my story is that I grew up in New York, and I had a speech impediment. Mm-hmm. I never. I stuttered. Mm-hmm. I never spoke outside. I mm-hmm. never. My sisters would always say, "Yeah, she doesn't talk. She wants vanilla ice cream with sprinkles, you know, or whatever." But I, mm-hmm. I would never. Mm-hmm. Speak. I wouldn't speak in school. And one day I had an uh, accident in school. My mother had to come up and change my clothes. And, and as she was changing me, she said, you have to find your voice. She said, mm. your sisters and I won't always be there to speak up for you. You have got to use your voice. Now, this was something like, for me, it was like saying we're going to go to the moon tomorrow because it just wasn't. <laughs> right. I didn't see that as ever going to be a thing, right? right? But I always remember that when my mom said to use to use my voice. 
So to, to fast forward to me as a black woman being on a platform where all I do is use my voice for other people is just a journey that mm-hmm. I could not have predicted. Right. I I am glad that I'm thankful to be on this journey because I hope that people, the amount of time that I spend with young people, and I, I don't have daughters, so I mentor young women. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, many have gone on to do some amazing things in politics and, and just in, in life that, you know, occasionally they'll call me when there are times something's great going on and they'll mm-hmm. say, Miss Bow, thank you for for helping me. And mm-hmm. that that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And right. for young women like you, like mm-hmm. using your voice and helping you in any way is powerful because what I believe to whoever's listening to this, you are the next generation. We are counting on you. We are mm-hmm. counting on you. It's like a, a relay you see in the Olympics. Mm-hmm. In a second, I'm going to reach my hand back with that baton. I need y'all to be in lockstep with me. Nice. And yeah. be reaching forward to grab that baton. And when I know you have it, I'm going to let that thing go. I'm going to watch you go across that finish line. Mm-hmm. Thank that, you. That's uh, it th- That This was so inspirational and motivating at the same time. Thank Senator you. Applewhite, thank you for your service, your advocacy, your hard work. As you are a Black woman and, and you advocate in politics and you make change, what advice would you give young Black individuals aspiring to enter into the political arena and make a difference in in our communities and beyond, you know, mm-hmm. know, know why you want to be in this space and, and let nothing deter you from that. Be smart about it. You know, we're still in the space where we have to be smarter and, you know, all than everyone else, mm-hmm. but know why you're, you're doing it and, and be smart about it. This is tough. This is hard mm-hmm. work, right? Mm-hmm. And surround yourself with like-minded people that have the courage. You know, it's not for the faint of heart. If you're scared, you just need to stay on the porch, <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right? But but you know, have a laser focus. A loss does not mean it's a loss. Sometimes a loss is a win. My loss in mayor was really a setup where I thought I was going to be the first black woman mayor instead of Mm -hmm. the first black woman senator, right? Nice. So for for young people, find out what inspires you. What is it that lights you on fire? Because you're going to need that inspiration when it gets hard and you're tired and you want to quit. Because I have many of those days when I say, look, I don't have to put up with this, right? But it is that fire in me that I'm inspired by that keeps me going. That's what I will share with young people. Be focused. Be disciplined. This is not playtime, right? People's lives depend on what you think and what you do. So, you know, putting all those things together, don't be afraid. Just get out there. Start knocking on doors and talking to people and say, hey, this is what I think. Find yourself a mentor. Find someone that you admire and and say, teach me how to do this. Teach me. Show me how. Get in the spaces where, 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 where changers are. You can't do this in isolation thinking, oh, I'm in my house, I'm going to go run, I'm going to go protest, and then I'm going to go run and change the world. You've got to be strategic in everything that you do and surround yourself with people that can help you. Love it. You know, it has definitely inspired me to reevaluate some things, probably put foot to pavement a little bit more in a political sense and getting our people engaged 
because this is a crucial year and not just like you said for the presidential elections, but also local ele- elections and bringing awareness to what that means and the power that the people have. So I appreciate a- awareness, so much. Aware- awareness to how it impacts their lives. People are going right. through things, right? Mm-hmm. Connect the dots to how this election impacts their lives and their children's lives. And I'm prayerful that, you know, as a people, I'm still conscious of all of the sacrifices that it took for us to get here. Maybe some younger people haven't, you know, are not aware of the stories, you know, but I, I'm certainly aware of that. But let's, let's meet people where they are mm-hmm. and and connect it to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, okay, I keep saying this is my last word, but I, this is it. My own saying is I work so hard. (laughs) I work hard for people, but I can't want something more for you than you want it for yourself. Mm. Mm? Right. Mm -hmm. Very true. I can't want it more for you. If you don't want it bad enough to go to the polls, okay. Oh, okay. I want it for you. Mm -hmm. I, I want you to have this life. I want you to have that. But if you're expecting me, to go and do all the work for you, it's just not going to happen. I can't want it more for you than you want it for yourself. 